Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to another edition of Coaching Insights. I'm your coach, David Rainishek with JuiceFeasting.com. Today, we're going to talk about coffee. This is a topic that has come up a lot in the last almost two decades of my coaching experience with clients one-on-one. -on -one. Most of us in the westernized world have encountered coffee if we're adults. So today, we're going to talk about the good news and the bad news of coffee. We are going to look at what to do if you are a coffee drinker and you're preparing for a juice feast, or you're a coffee drinker and you're not preparing for a juice feast, but you see the fact that you drink coffee as an opportunity perhaps to upgrade your health by moving beyond this, evolving beyond coffee to something that will still provide you a lot of happiness, but also benefit your health more immensely than coffee will and keep you on your mental game for your parenting, for your professional life, and anything that you're doing. So we're gonna look into that today. The good news and bad news of coffee. Now, where I grew up in Texas, hot drinks weren't much of a thing. It took me to adult age, like actually late into my 20s before I really had my first cup of coffee when I moved to the Pacific Northwest. But I do have experience with coffee. I've done the bulletproof coffee route, mixing in coconut oil or butter with coffee, plus cacao and honey, and um, various things. It was delicious. I've done that for several years. So just so that you know, I'm very familiar with coffee drinking. I did it on a daily basis for several years and did benefit for a while from that, but found over time that the benefits started to give way to detriments, like many things in our lives that are going well for a while, but don't really have longevity to them. Coffee is one of those things. So um, there is an energetic bump clearly that you're getting from coffee. You get an adrenaline response, you get a dopamine response as a serotonin response when you get coffee. And that bump will last you anywhere from 20 minutes to a few hours as you've experienced. This is the tricky thing with coffee. Over a 20 minute to a couple of hour period, you probably will perform better than had you not had a cup of coffee at all, particularly if you're already feeling drained from something like adrenal fatigue, okay? Or from imbalanced blood sugar or from chronic pain. It's a number of things that you might be uh, drinking coffee for. And for a little while, you'll get that bump. But over the course of a week, day to day, your overall performance and happiness and well-being as a human being will be diminished by drinking coffee. But when you get that downhill run after coffee, you get decreased focus, you get poor blood sugar, that leads to excessive cravings for sweet foods. So you may have encountered this. You may see that coffee drinking tends to go hand in hand with eating foods that are processed or are excessively sweet, and that gets you into a negative cycle. Um, coffee is going to increase inflammation in your system. Why is that? Well, it's gonna imbalance your blood sugar, for one thing. And when your blood sugar is excessively high, that's going to increase inflammatory markers across the board not just in your cardiovascular system, but in the joints in your body and things like your liver and your kidneys and so on. People with skin conditions can even see a flare up of their skin conditions when inflammatory markers rise in the body, okay? You're gonna experience poor sleep. And of course, poor sleep means imbalanced hormones. It means less skillful mental performance during the day. It means that your immune function is down. So the bottom line on coffee is, you're gonna get a little bump for a little while, but the net effect over the course of the week and from week to week to week over the course of your lifetime is you're diminished in function as a person. And notably, in terms of our conversation about health, you're going to have reduced immune function and that is going to dog you for the rest of your life and you want to have peak immune function clearly, all right? So what can we do about moving beyond coffee in service to our health without giving up the fact that this cup is pretty nice. Now, it's really nice to get up in the morning and have something warm, something that tastes good, something that is ritualistic to make. A lot of us like to grind the coffee bean. It smells good. It's nice to put the water on. It's nice to pour it up. I even like the sound of hot water in my cup. Okay? The things that we're going for, and this is a key feature of my coaching, when you look at something that you know you need to move beyond, what you're going for in that thing that you need to move beyond is probably great. What you're going for with coffee is great. You want to feel better. 
You want to have better mental performance. You want to be on point or just be happier or um, just something that's consistent in your morning that you know you can look forward to, okay? Because life will throw you all kinds of things that you don't plan on. So how can we achieve all of those good things we're going for with coffee without doing the coffee itself and increasing inflammatory markers, um, negatively impacting sleep, blood sugar, immune function, etc. The easiest way to come off coffee, whether you're getting into a juice feast, prepping for a juice feast, or whether you're just doing this for the benefit of your health long term, the easiest way to come off this is over three to 14 days. You wanna dial back the amount of caffeine that you're drinking. Now you can go cold turkey. I've had clients who do it. We meet for an initial consultation for two or three hours. They understand the benefits they're about to get from their juice feast and from leaving caffeine behind. And they say, I'm gonna drop this like a bad habit and just move on. It can be done. You'll get headaches for a few days. You'll feel a bit diminished. It's easier to go ahead and just start drawing back the amount of caffeine that you're drinking over three to 14 days. Why do I say three to 14 days? If it's a single cup a day, three days and you should be off of it. If it's been four or five cups a day, if you're that kind of a coffee drinker, then it may take you up to two weeks to really come off. And the way to do that is to go ahead and initially just cut your coffee back to about half of what you've done. And then depending on how much coffee you've been drinking, keep on dialing that back by a quarter or a half until you're done in a few days or in the case of four to five cups a day or more, maybe a couple of weeks. And by weaning yourself off, you don't get this absolutely abominable crash off of caffeine, which is a pretty hard drug to come off of, as it turns out. So you can take a few days. Question often arises, can I drink coffee during my juice feast even as I'm coming off of it? Yes, we're only looking at a few days. So if you've got a start date for your juice feast, and you're just weaning yourself off of coffee, go ahead and start that coffee weaning process and start into your juice feast. But what are you going to be replacing that with? I've got a few suggestions for you today, so here we go. Matcha, green tea, really fancy stuff from Japan. It's got some caffeine in it, but there's also a lot of immune boosting elements in green tea that we've known about for decades and decades and decades. Pretty straightforward. So you could go ahead and shift out of coffee into green tea and then treat the green tea like coffee, it's got a lighter amount of caffeine in it, and go ahead and start dialing that back over the same period of time as you would have coffee and that will still bring you off the caffeine a bit more easily. So that's a nice way to do it. Having some chocolate. Now on a juice feast, we don't do cacao powder and we don't eat chocolate, but if you're outside of a juice feasting context, go ahead and put some cacao into some nut milk, right? or put some cacao in with some kind of a tea that you make. I'm gonna mention a specific one momentarily. Have a little bit of 90%, 95%, 98% cacao and eat that. And that will start to give you the mental edge that you're looking for without the detrimental effects of coffee. The next thing that you could look into doing, which I speak to all my clients about, is doing spirulina or elixir of the lake, um, which is a product out of Klamath Lake in Oregon. Um, spirulina and elixir of the lake, those two things have a high amount of phycocyanin. Phycocyanin is the blue pigment in spirulina. It's why spirulina is known as a blue-green algae. Now, something like chlorella is a microalgae like spirulina, but we don't call it a blue-green algae. It's just a microalgae. But spirulina is a very special thing with that phycocyanin in it. And phycocyanin, that blue pigment, is a potent activator of the brain. It acts like a neurochemical in the brain. I put it on par with or beyond what coffee will do for you. Spirulina doesn't have a small amount of phycocyanin in it. It's actually quite a lot. And Elixir of the Lake has even more than your garden variety spirulina does. Of course, spirulina mixes really well into a green smoothie, into a green vegetable juice. You can make a fresh fruit juice and blend either of those two things in there. But phycocyanin, the phycocyanin content in spirulina and an elixir of the lake is going to give you everything that you're looking for mentally from coffee without dropping you off. The next thing to integrate when you're moving beyond coffee is a significant asset. This asset is the top herb that I have my clients use to get over low, moderate, or extreme adrenal fatigue. And that herb is Tulsi. You may have heard it as holy basil. 
But Tulsi tea is available at any health food store. It makes a delightful tasting tea. It has a very mild taste, but really benefits your body in terms of reducing cortisol. Cortisol is an adrenal hormone that gets released at pretty high levels when you drink something like coffee or if you get scared or if you're chronically stressed. Most of us in Western society have low to moderate adrenal fatigue and our cortisol levels are too high. When your cortisol is too high, this offsets your blood sugar balance, which makes you hypoglycemic oftentimes, which makes you eat foods that you wouldn't normally otherwise eat just to try to bring your blood sugar back up. Um, high cortisol also increases inflammation throughout the body. So if you have inflammatory pain and you're a coffee drinker, you definitely want to be moving over to Tulsi because it's going to reduce your cortisol levels, which relaxes your adrenal glands and is going to reduce inflammation across your body, which is going to reduce pain. Inflammation also is the fourth stage of disease out of seven stages, seventh stage being cancer. So we want to reduce inflammation any way that we can, and reducing cortisol is an important way of doing that. So Tulsi is an excellent tea. The way I like to describe the feeling that you get from drinking Tulsi, I like to compare it to coffee um, when I'm working with my adrenal clients. And coffee sends you up in a rocket ship, like Elon Musk's big Falcon Heavy rocket, just, just right off the ground, right through the stratosphere. Um, it also has you crashing back to Earth like one of Elon Musk's rockets once that thing is ready to come back down. Tulsi's different. With Tulsi, imagine that you're an eagle or some kind of a bird with really big wings and you get a thermal underneath your wings that lifts you up a few hundred feet and just kind of keeps you there kind of gliding around on those nice air currents. That's what Tulsi does. And it never really lets you down. Um, as you're coming off of Tulsi, so to speak, which has no caffeine in it, it's just a very gentle drift like you're a bird just kind of riding around on thermals. So um, it helps you to feel more oxygenated, helps you to feel more grounded, more present. Um, it helps you feel greater equanimity in your life. And again, it's the number one herb that I have my clients do, whether they have mild, moderate, or extreme adrenal fatigue. So bring in Tulsi tea, also known as holy basil, as you're moving the caffeine, the coffee out of your life. Tulsi is nice in that you can have it up to six times a day, so you can have multiple cups of it. I buy it in tea bags, but I also will get Tulsi in a tincture and have my clients get it in a tincture that you can just squirt right into a glass of water. The advantage there being that you don't have to boil a pot of water and then make your Tulsi tea. You could be out and about, you could be at a restaurant and just take your glass of water and squirt the tincture in there and get the benefits of Tulsi tea. So look that up. The last one is a drink called Dandy Blend. Dandy Blend is kind of a ritualistic way of replacing the ritual of coffee. Dandy Blend is made from chicory and acorn and sometimes a little bit of um, beet. And, um, and Dandy Blend also has dandelion in it, which is great for your liver. When you make up Dandy Blend, the cup that you make up with hot water will look very much like coffee. It has a very similar mouthfeel to coffee. It has a similar acidity to coffee. And you can add things to it in the same way that you would add things to coffee. Now, if you're trying to get over coffee and reduce your average blood sugar, I'd recommend that you're not putting sugar in your Dandy Blend. Instead, put something like Stevia in there or a middle ground to be add a teaspoon of honey in there. Of course, you can use non-dairy um, creamer like um, making a hemp seed milk or another kind of nut or a seed milk, or you can use some real cream depending on where you are on the spectrum of diet. But check out Dandy Blend. Another name for Dandy Blend or another kind of variety on this is a product called Akava, which is less expensive. Dandy Blend is probably three times as expensive. I think it Dandy Blend tastes a little bit better, but Akava for your dollar goes a long, long way. Akava is spelled A-K-A-V-A, -A -A, and I'll put an image of both of these on the screen so that you can see them and source them. Um, either of these can be had in the midst of a juice feast. I tend to encourage my clients not to have these things on a juice feast, but if you're coming off coffee and it's a uh, choice between having coffee or having Tulsi tea, having um, some dandy blend during your juice feast, I'd rather you go that route but it's a nice ritualistic cup that you can make and is a great way to move beyond coffee. And for today, that is it. Thank you for joining me for another edition of Coaching Insights. If you like the content of this 
session and you'd like to share it with others, please do. If you haven't subscribed to the YouTube channel, the Juice Feasting YouTube channel, please click subscribe below and click the notification bell so that you'll get notifications when the next edition of Coaching Insights comes out. For today, thank you for being on. I'm David Ranishek with JuiceFeasting.com. Be well.